Hello, Pokemon Masters, Berkey Matobi here, and welcome back to Sinnoh Week, a new video every single day to celebrate the release of Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, which come out this week. I, of course, will be playing Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl on release, and I have a, a, a very special kind of run-through planned, so don't miss out on that. Do come along to that. In today's video, I'm going to be going through 10 more Sinnoh theories, because last week when I did 10 Sinnoh theories, there, there are just so many small theories about the Sinnoh region that I've been building up over the last six years. Before we jump into that, though, don't forget to take the like button to the daycare center and leave it there. And when you say, don't worry, I'll be back, instead, take your angriest Tyranitar, put that in the daycare center with with it and then leave it there forever. And of course, don't forget, because Brilliant Diamond Channing Pearl are in the title of this video, you are in with the chance of winning a copy of Legends Arceus if you leave a comment on the video as well. I'll be picking the winners when the game comes out. Right, here we go, 10 more very small Sinnoh theories. Let's do this. Okay, so here we go. And again, don't forget, like, if you want more Sinnoh theories, if you're not satisfied after this, I did another whole video on 10 Sinnoh theories just last week, and then I have another video on three Sinnoh theories that are terrible because it's all Sinnoh focused right now. I'll be honest, I kind of thought that maybe they would do Gen 4 remakes, you know, after they did Gen 3 remakes. So I've been building up a list of Sinnoh topics for a long, long time. Oh, maybe nearly time to start a Google Doc for your Nova so that I'm ready for six years time. Right, let's start with an oldie but a goodie. Number one, Professor Sycamore is not only from the Sinnoh region, but is the parent of the player character that you play as in Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl. Sorry, hang on, what? Y yeah, you know, Professor Sycamore, the one with the fantastic hair, almost as good as mine. Well, Professor Sycamore studies mega evolution and he studied under the main researcher for regular Pokemon evolution, which is Professor Rowan, who was inspired by Charles Darwin, the father of modern evolution as we understand it. So, naturally, it would make sense for Professor Sycamore to study under Professor Rowan, and actually that is in the lore. Professor Sycamore wasn't originally from the uh, Kalos region. In fact, he got the train there, and you can find his letter from when he first arrived in the Kalos region at an abandoned train station. So we know that Professor Sycamore was an aide to Professor Rowan, and actually in Professor Rowan's lab, there is one of his aides, is the father character of the player character of the Sinnoh games. And specifically, what do we see when we look to Dawn and Lucas, when we look to their attire? We see that Lucas is wearing what looks to be a beret, a very French-inspired piece of clothing, which of course, Kalos is based off of France. So is there a possible connection or relationship here? I don't know, it's just one of 10 very small theories that we're going through today. Number two, this is one that actually bothers me a lot because I talk a lot about the evolutionary tree of life and how Pokemon are related to each other. And people are always telling me that Magnum is a man-made Pokemon, and it's not. It's just not. I get it because Magnemite is pretty synonymous with Voltorb. They're both generation one, two stage electric Pokemon, but Magnemite's lore was expanded in a totally different way to Voltorb. Whereas Voltorb is clearly found in the Pokeball factories and is a man-made Pokemon, Magnemite is not. Magnemite is natural. It's just not natural for planet Earth. Magnemite is an alien Pokemon, and we learn this when we start looking at the Pokedex entries of Magnezone that said when it started showing up, people started mistaking it for a UFO. Now, that on its own isn't enough. But you'll notice that the Magnemite line and the Beldum line look like they would be very closely related. When we look to these evolution lines, we see two three-stage evolution Pokemon, in which the first stage is a metal body with a single eye. By the way, the Beldum shiny looks a lot like the silver of the Magnemite line. Then the evolution path is kind of the combination of more of the pre-evolution. So Beldum is coming together to make Matang and Metagross, and Magnemite's coming together to make Magneton. And both of these Pokemon have a very intentional relationship with Electro. Electromagnetism being a lot of what they eat and what they're fueled by and how they float. And Beldum is found from meteorites that fall from space in the Alola region. It's found on the top of the mountain where, like, you can also find, uh, what's it called? Mini Orb. Mini Orb. You can find Mini Orb and other space Pokemon on that same mountain top because it's descending from space. Steven Stone is absolutely obsessed with meteorites that fall from space. And he is the only trainer in the whole Hoenn region who even has a Metagross. And in the Alola region, we even see, if you go to the uh, the power plant, you can even see Magnezone in the night sky flying around being drawn there because the Pokemon is an alien. And if you need any more proof of this fact, you can see Magnemite in the ancient war 3000 years ago with AZ. So between that and Magnezone, it is proof that Magnezone is an alien Pokemon 
Not a man-made Pokemon. Oh, I get very passionate about this. And speaking of aliens, let's move on to number three. Number three, we're gonna talk about Porygon Z or Porygon Z, whatever you prefer. The Porygon line is absolutely fascinating. Obviously, it's kind of a quirk of technology in Generation 1 being made with the latest technologies, according to its Pokedex entries in Pokemon Fire Red. And of course, it is a Pokemon designed to survey and explore cyberspace. However, throughout the history of the Pokemon world, and I'm having trouble kind of placing this, but I feel like Porygon has had a bit of a connection with just regular space. Maybe it's because it can survive in space because it is a artificial being, I don't know. But what we do know is that when it evolved into Porygon 2, according to Porygon 2's Pokedex Centuries, it was designed to explore deep space. But then in generation four, we get this corruption, Porygon Z. A project that was, according to its Pokedex Centuries, originally designed to explore alternate dimensions, but something went wrong. Something went wrong in the programming or the coding. And Generation 4 is an interesting time to get this evolution because it is the, the, the generation that introduced us to the topic of other dimensions, time and space, Diamond and Pearl. And specifically in Pokemon Platinum version, you could find the dubious disc in the Team Galactic headquarters. So is it possible that Porygon Z was an original project by Team Galactic to explore alternate dimensions to help root out Pokemon like Giratina? Again, it's a normal type, so that would be good, I guess, against Giratina because it can attack with elemental attacks, but then be neutral against the, or, or resist the ghost moves. It is possible, especially because all of the scientists that work in the Team Galactic headquarters in Diamond Pearl all use Kadabra, a Pokemon that is commonly associated with Saffron City where Silphco is, and Silphco was the company that designed the original Porygon. So maybe some defectors from there? An alternative though is that it wasn't actually Team Galactic that developed this Pokemon and that maybe it was the Aether Foundation because the dubious disc can also be found in the Aether Paradise in Sun and Moon and I'm pretty sure like um, Gladion also has a Porygon Z and again a Pokemon designed to explore alternate dimensions the Ultra Beasts are from alternate dimensions, so that would also make sense. So I don't really mind who you pick here, Aether Foundation or Team Galactic, I think both make sense. Number four, this is a theory by Derek Triforce, and it's a really good one, and it's just why aren't there any Mamoswine in the Johto region? Because Piloswine and Swinub were introduced in the Johto region, um, but you can't find Mamoswine there. But Mamoswine is part of the Sinnoh Pokedex, so how come? What happened? Well, according to Pokedex entries, Mamoswine started, the numbers started thinning out when the Ice Age ended, and we know that there was an Ice Age, or there was a lot more snow and ice in the Sinnoh region relatively recently, because the Hisui region wasn't that many hundreds of years ago, uh, if that even, and it was covered in a lot more snow than it is nowadays, and that snow has receded up to Snow Point, which means perhaps the snow stretched all the way down to Johto and even the icy path. There is the only place that you can find Swinub, but it seems like as the temperatures rose and the snow started disappearing, the Swinub found it hard to get to their full evolution Mamoswine and the group of Mamoswine that had the ancient power move that it needs to evolve. Again, an ancient power, by the way, it's no longer really around because that group of Mamoswine died out. And I'm pretty sure the only way to teach ancient power to a Swinub is through an egg move, so it was unable to breed with anything that had ancient power and it could no longer access that evolution. I remember that the theory used to go that then what happened is that the Swinub and Piloswine had to get used to living in a non-icy climate, and so that's how they diverged and became the Pokemon Fanpy and Donphan, but I don't even think the original author of this theory even agrees with that anymore. I might be wrong, because while at first you look at Mamoswine and you look at Donphan and you go, oh, Mamoswine is a mammoth, Donphan is an elephant, they're closely related. Mamoswine technically isn't a mammoth. It's more likely to be related to Pokemon like Grumpig and Embor because it is a swine. Mamo is just describing mammoth as in the size. It is a mammoth swine, a mammoth pig. So you'd actually assume it's probably closely related to pig Pokemon, although the pig in its Hmm, because there are pygmy elephants, small elephants, which Fanpy is, so maybe they are closely related. Maybe it's more related to elephants. I would love to hear what you have to think about that in the comment section down below. Number five, another Pokemon relationship that I kind of thought about a little bit last year and I made a video on, and that was the Dusk Noir. How does it connect on an evolutionary tree of life? Ghosts in general are hard to place because people think that they are dead Pokemon, but they're not really dead. They are the ghost type, which is a type of living creature. And ghost in the Pokemon world, more so than death, tends to actually refer to 
otherworldly. In the fantasy, science, fiction-y, otherworldly, ghosts and ghouls kind of way. It's not necessarily specific to death, because Pokemon can die and then they're just dead. They don't necessarily become ghost Pokemon. Anyway, the point of this is that many ghost Pokemon come from other dimensions, and we see this in Haunter's Pokedex entry that talks about how it's coming through from another dimension, even though it's made up of gaseous stuff, and Gengar has Pokedex entries talking about how it used to be human. Giratina is like the original ghost Pokemon from the Distortion world, another dimension, and we see in the animated series portals to the ghost dimension. Well, here I had a thought. The perhaps ghost Pokemon aren't just like the dead, but specifically they're the dead of other dimensions, giving them this otherworldly trait that make them uh, ghost Pokemon. And that would make sense for Duskenoir because it has a connection with a Pokemon from another dimension. Guzzlord. This is an Ultra Beast, and if you look at them side by side, you immediately realize that they look very similar with their black gray bodies, with a big yellow mouth in the center of it. When you look at their Pokedex entries, you learn that their stomachs are like black holes or contain black holes, and they've got the stomach face, and then they've got the small mini face on the top with a very big hand. So they look super similar. They've got similar Pokedex entries. And what's more, when we look at the Ultra Ruin, where you can find Guzzlord in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, we actually find a human who is dressed up kind of like Guzzlord. It's not hard to imagine that this human died or became stuck in this dimension, and then over time became the ghost Pokemon Duskenoir, and then using its antenna, it tried to pick up radio waves and made its way through to another dimension, much in the same way that Haunter does, and thus it is now a Pokemon. Duskenoir, the ghost type, the otherworldly type. Personally, I totally buy this, and it also explains how Pokemon like Gengar can have origin stories explaining how they used to be human, but then Haunter has Pokedex entries talking about how it's coming through from another dimension, and those two things can still be true. They're the dead of other dimensions. Number six, let's talk about the Pokemon Kubfu, introduced in the Isle of Armor, and many of you already know what I'm going to say, because perhaps you've heard me talk about this recently. I am fully convinced on this theory. Kubfu, while originally from Galar a long, long time ago, actually traveled around the Pokemon world and has been away from Galar for a long time, training in all sorts of places, learning different fighting styles, and was recently brought back by Mustard to the Isle of Armor a place where the dojo shares a lot of aesthetic with Kanto, Johto, and Sinnoh, and the Mali City Garden in the, uh, in the Alola region. But what we know is that Kubfu trained to be strong in the mountains of other regions, and when we look to those regions and we look to their mountains, the only places that have really big mountain ranges that would make sense for Kubfu are maybe Johto, Kanto, and Sinnoh. I, I can't see Kubfu training on Mount Pyre. But Kubfu, given that it's a mythical Pokemon introduced in the same generation as the Diamond Pearl remakes, you really start looking at the Sinnoh region, and Sinnoh makes so much sense, because before Sinnoh was Sinnoh, it was the Hisui region. A region where Pokemon used to fight in the style of Agile or Single Strike, is it? That's right, the Strong and Agile style, which are much like the Rapid and Single Strike forms of Urshifu, the Pokemon that Kubfu evolves into. So clearly it went to Sinnoh, learned that fighting style, and then came back to the Alola re Galar region. Alola to the Galar region. And on top of this, to top it all off, Sinnoh is known for its honey trees, and Kubfu likes the honey from those trees, and in fact, I think you need the honey, or the Gigantamax honey from a honey tree, to evolve Kubfu into Urshifu, so it all ties together. Number seven is another one of those Pokemon relationships that is by my friend Loxton. I absolutely loved this theory when I saw, first saw it, and that was that the Pokemon of the Galar region are supposed to have real reasons as to why they were chosen to be in the Galar region. This was talked about in an interview uh, when the game were com was coming out. So there was this question, like, why is Frostlass there? Because Frostlass is a very heavily Japanese-inspired Pokemon based on a yokai that is a very famous popular bit of Japanese mythology and folklore. But the answer is in the Pokemon Snow Runt, Frostlass's pre-evolution. A Pokemon that looks not too dissimilar from Phalanx. Uh, of course, it would just be one phalanx, not five of them. And Loxin's theory is that a snow runt is the runt of the litter of a group of phalanx, the one that couldn't keep up with them in their marching. Look at them, they've got the small round black body, the little spiky head, they've got the blue eyes, and then the coloration of the thing that they wear is exactly the same. And it would explain why when it evolves, it becomes very ghost-like. Even if it becomes a Glalie, it's becoming very ghostly being able to float. And I definitely remember thinking Glalie used to be a ghost runner 
I was a kid. It's because that one phalanx couldn't keep up and fell behind and became a snow runt. But then the question is, well, hang on, how come there are snow runt in regions where phalanx aren't? And the answer to that is very, very simple. Phalanx not only marches a long, long way to come back to the Galar region, leaving behind loads of snow runt everywhere, but also a phalanx is only as strong as the entire formation. And the moment one falls behind, it's going to weaken the formation, causing all of them to fall behind. And suddenly you just have all of the phalanx formations break down and become snow runs, groups of snow runs, which perhaps the reason they become snow runs specifically is because it is the snow is the hardest place that they have to travel through. They really struggle in that environment. So the entire formation breaks down and then it just becomes a herd of, of snow runt. Now, just quickly before I move on to number eight, I wanted to say a thank you to those of you watching. I've started addressing the people that watched this far into a video about Pokemon theories as my secret audience. That is you, those of you who are watching. Thank you for the support. It really means a lot. That's it. Just a little thank you. You're wonderful. Let's move on to number eight. In my last 10 Sinnoh theories video, I talked about how there are so many theories about how Fione happens and how when you breed a Manaphy with a Ditto, it becomes a, a Ditto. It becomes a Fione instead of another Manaphy. And like, why does that happen? I had a theory in that video, but I have a totally different theory in this video. And that is all to do with the way that Ditto breeds. Ditto cannot breed with Pokemon that don't have an egg group. Those are either uh, uh, baby Pokemon or legendary Pokemon, generally speaking. And Ditto is a Pokemon that copies information. That's what it does. It duplicates information. So the idea is, is it can't reproduce with a Pokemon that is like a baby Pokemon because that Pokemon does not have the genetic information to be able to breed itself. The DNA, the genetics, they're just not mature enough for a baby Pokemon. So that makes sense. And then for legendary Pokemon, the idea is they are legendary and their DNA, their genetic structure is super, super complicated. So Ditto struggles to be able to like, I mean, obviously we know Ditto can transform into legendary Pokemon, but it struggles to copy that information and then be able to like turn it into an egg because that's how Pokemon reproduce. They don't do it the conventional way that you might be thinking about. They do it by copying information and then creating a magical egg, these cradles that contain Pokemon, but it's just too complicated for Ditto. But Manaphy is a mythical Pokemon that is just simple enough that Ditto can give it a go. But it is still a mythical Pokemon. And so the result that you get is like a Manaphy, but just not close enough. And that's what Fione is. And that's how you explain why Manaphy breeds and produces Fione with Ditto instead of more Manaphy. Because it is, at the end of the day, a mythical Pokemon, just perhaps the most simple, uh, genetically speaking. And that actually does sort of hold up with what we know from Manaphy's Pokedex entries. Because according to its Pokedex entries, Manaphy's body is up to 80% water, which means Ditto has a lot less work than it would have with, say, a Dialga or a Palkia. But here it still struggles because it's a mythical Pokemon, thus producing Fione. Number nine, I've been trying to weave this into a theory. This is less of a theory and more of an observation, I'll be honest. But the legendary Pokemon of the Sinnoh region, Mesprit, Uxi, and Azelf are the lake spirits. And they travel around the Sinnoh region, but they are responsible for bringing willpower, emotion, and uh, knowledge to the Sinnoh region, in theory. I am wondering what their role is going to be like in Legends Arceus. A anyway, they are, of course, catchable in other games, like in Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire. They're catchable by a way of a Hooper portal um, in Ultra and Ultra Moon. You go through of wormholes to catch them in, into other dimensions and then of course in uh, the crown tundra they appear in the big underground network that is the max raid layer possibly traveling from all across the pokemon world and this idea of traveling through tunnels to get to other places in the pokemon world lines up with the unova region because in black and white 2 they appear in a nameless cavern and this cavern looks a lot like the lake caverns that you see in the Sinnoh region and it is said that this cavern connects to the Sinnoh region directly. At first, I just assumed this was like a metaphorical tunnel, like, oh yeah, it connects to the Sinnoh region, but it doesn't really. It's just like, it's, they're just saying that it's just a little bit of lore, a little bit of flavor, but maybe it really does. Anyway, this lake trio then dissipate across the Nova region, and they all go to very specific uh, locations that I now understand why they go there. Mesprit, the leader of the trio, appears at the Celestial Tower, and that makes sense because Mesprit is the emotions Pokemon. It's tied to human emotions, and the Celestial Tower is a grave site where emotions would be very, very strong. 
Roxy appears just outside the museum in Narseen City, Nacreen City. I always get the name of this wrong, but appears just outside the library. And that makes sense because Uxi is the knowledge Pokemon and a library is a place where you would obtain a lot of knowledge. And meanwhile, Anzelf appears very randomly, it seems, on Route 23 of the Innova region until you realize that Azelf is the willpower Pokemon and Route 23 is just in front of the Pokemon League in the Elite Four. It would take a lot of willpower to get through Victory Road and get to the Elite Four. And so that's why the Pokemon appear where they do in the Unova region. And finally, we have number 10, Regigigas. There are many theories about Regigigas. I actually did one about a year ago now, which is this big live action spectacle. I'll leave a link to that in the description because uh, I really love this video, but I don't want to cover that theory because it's quite long and quite complicated. However, earlier this year, I did do a theory about the fact that Regigigas probably fought with Heatran in the ancient past, and that's how Heatran is a legendary Pokemon because there is a legend about it. See, we know that according to its Pokedex entries, Regigigas can move continents, but we've never actually seen that in action, have we? Well, it's possible this ties into an anime-only storyline where they talk about the fact that there used to be a volcano around Snowpoint City that, when it erupted, threatened the whole of Snowpoint City until Regigigas saved the city. Is it possible that Regigigas saved the city by moving the continent that had the volcano on, the island that is the Battle Resort in Generation 4? That island has a volcano, Stark Mountain, where you find the Pokemon Heatran. Heatran and Regigigas are next to each other in the Pokedex. They're also two legendary Pokemon that I found to be relatively paired together in like promotional events and that kind of thing. And so I do wonder, is there a history there? Is there an ancient legend in which Heatran's volcanic eruption threatened the Sinnoh region? Of course, we've seen the Hisui region map and we do know at, during that time that the, uh, the Stark Mountain volcano is still off of the mainland. So maybe it's not that. We also know there's an area called the volcanic, uh, the, the obsidian field lands and obsidian is a rock made as a result of volcanic activity. So perhaps I'm totally wrong on this and Heatran has a different history with the region. But if this ever got confirmed and that there was some kind of ancient war between Regigigas and Heatran, I wouldn't be surprised. And there you have it. There are 10 mini Sinnoh theories, quick fire ones. Of course, if you want to see 10 more, I've done a whole video on that. If you want to see three Sinnoh theories that are terrible, I've done a <laughs> video on that. And if you want to see that cool Regigigas theory, I've done a video on that. There is plenty of time to catch up on theories and enjoy content, getting ready for Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, or perhaps while you're even playing. Don't forget to leave a comment on this video so you are in with a chance of winning a copy of Legends Arceus when it comes out. And don't forget, take the like button to the daycare man, the daycare lady, drop off the like button. And when you say you promise that you'll be back, don't come back. Instead, leave your angriest Tyranitar with it and then leave forever. Right, I will see you tomorrow with more videos for Sinnoh Week. Thank you all for watching. And of course, so high Pokemon Masters. This is Ash Ketchum. You just watched a video by Bird Keeper Toby. That makes you a Pokemon master. I still just can't get over how much love this channel has. Thank you for the support of my patrons and especially the big patrons of the month. JD Gottlich, Michael Horn, Chupoki Atmos, Stefan Peters, Pony Blitz, and Jed Rubin. Thank you.